Today I'm going to be doing a little bit of wood turning and I'm going to be making the handles for the saw. These are just some rough blanks I had laying around. I believe it's birch, but you can make this out of just about anything. The actual handles aren't really going to be uh, under that much stress, so just about any kind of wood will work just fine. The first thing I need to do is drill a hole right through the center of this block, and that's so that I can install the pins that are actually going to hold on to the blade. So anytime you're turning in wood and you need to work around a central hole, it's always good practice to put that hole in the center first. I'm going to be drilling into end grain and the drill is always going to want to follow the path of least resistance. So it's going to wander. You can just count on it wandering somewhat. Yeah, no matter how hard you try to get the hole in straight, by the time you get to the other side, it's going to be off slightly. So as you can see, I'm using the longest drill bit that I have, and I'm going to need to sight it down two planes to be able to get it going straight. I'm standing over the drill, so I'm going to be able to sight down the top edge very easily, uh, but I also need to sight over where you're standing and looking back. So now I'm using the camera because I'm filming this so I can see what I'm doing and I can line the drill up that way. But if that wasn't the case, I would set up a mirror on a chair or something so I can see the horizontal plane of the drill and I would use that to line it up as best I can and at least make an attempt to get the hole in straight. So I'm just going to take my time and pull the drill out off and to clear out the chips and then every once in a while I'm going to rotate the block to try to minimize the air. The reason I'm drilling it all the way from one side and not from both sides the way I did the uh, frame is because I want this to be a really straight hole. Even if it's crooked in the block I want the hole to be straight so that when I insert that pin I don't run into a problem with having to bend the pin to follow the hole. And here you can see how the hole wandered off the center line a little bit, but that's okay. This is going to be the narrow end of the handle, so I have lots of room to turn this round. Today I'm just going to be using three different chisels. This one's called a roughing gouge. It's ground perfectly square across the front, and as you can see it has a very deep flute to it. This chisel just basically has one purpose. It just takes a square block and turns it into a round billet by removing a tremendous amount of material very quickly. If you're not familiar with wood turning, the only principle that you really need to understand is that the cutting edge needs to be supported. So with this chisel, the point of contact with the work always has to be directly in line with the point of contact with the tool rest. So if I rotate this tool to use a different part of the cutting edge, I still maintain that relationship. Regardless of where I am, I always make sure that the point of contact, the part that's making the chips, is always sitting directly over the tool rest. This is one of a few chisels that needs to be totally supported by the tool rest. So if you let that point of contact get too far off center, the cutting edge is no longer going to be supported, so it's going to want to twist in your hand, and once it does, it'll grab and it'll rotate very, very violently. The next chisel is just a standard spindle turning gouge, and it has what's referred to as a fingernail grind, that sort of oval shape at the front. And it's used to carve out all of the hollow curves in the design. What would normally be referred to as a cove in a molding. Even though the tip of this chisel is curved, the very tip is rarely used as a cutting edge. This is actually two chisels that have been combined into one tool. The cutting edges are the two slopes that follow from that point, so the one half is used to define a curve that goes from right to left, and the other slope defines a curve heading in the opposite direction. The tip is always held outside of that point of contact. Even though spindle gouges seem a lot less intimidating than the roughing gouge, they really take a, quite a long time to master because there are a lot of different applications and ways that the cutting edge can be supported. They're not a simple tool like a roughing gouge that simply gets pushed into the work in one direction. 
But even though it is a little bit more complicated, understanding the basic principles of all wood turning chisels will allow you to figure out what's going on very quickly and hopefully minimize that amount of time that you're going to be screwing things up. When you start a cove cut, the tip of the chisel is going to be scribing a very thin line that's going to define the starting point for that cove. At this point, the chisel is totally supported by the tool rest, so the cutting edge has to be directly over that point, so the chisel is held vertically. Once you move the chisel into the work, the bevel is going to start rubbing on the groove that you're making with the chisel. And once that happens, you now have two areas that are supporting the cutting edge. The bottom edge of the chisel is being supported by the tool rest, and the top edge of the chisel is being supported by the bevel that's rubbing in the cut. So at this point, you can start rotating the chisel to define the size of the curve that you want to make, because your cutting edge is actually now being bridged between two points on either side. You have the tool rest and the bevel edge that is rubbing on the spindle. And this is a very, very stable platform to make a cut, provided that you keep the tip out of the work. Once the tip starts to dig in, you lose that bevel edge support and the chisel once again gets grabbed and torn out of your hands. The last chisel that I'm going to be using is called a skew chisel and it's used uh, in two ways. One, it's kind of like a hand plane that smooths off long straight sections and it's also used to form the ball sections of the turnings. And even though it's a flat chisel, it's used exactly the same way as a spindle gouge. Bottom edge is supported on the tool rest, and then depending on what you're doing, you support the top edge with the bevel rubbing, and then the cutting edge needs to be between the bevel rub and the tool rest. And just like the spindle gouge, once you lose your position and allow the cutting edge to ride up a little too high on the chisel, the cutting edge is going to lose its support and the chisel is just going to grab and get torn out of your hands. So here I have the uh, wood mounted in the lathe. The spur center, the drive center, is set up in the hole that I've drilled as well as the live center is set up on the other side in the hole that I've drilled. So that hole is going to be at the center of the work and everything that I'm going to be doing is just going to be removing all of the wood around and making it a concentric turning. I have the tool rest set up so it's sitting a little bit below center and I've spun the work around to make sure that it's not going to run into the tool rest. So now I'm ready to actually turn the lathe on and start making some chips. When you're starting to rough in a really wonky piece of wood like this you really have to take your time. Uh, the rough blank to begin with wasn't sawn square so I had a taper already plus the drill hole went a little bit off center so that means that when I'm starting in some areas I'm only hitting one or two corners so you just have to take your time and work through that once you start getting you know something that looks even slightly like an octagonal piece of wood things really start to speed up Here I'm getting ready to actually start shaping the handle. This is the start of the cut. The chisel is vertical. The point of contact is just below the tip of the chisel and the chisel is being totally supported at this point by the tool rest. 
once the chisel breaks the surface, the bevel is going to start rubbing and you're going to see me rotate the tool so that I can start defining the curve. And you're going to notice that the chips are going to start peeling off the lower slope of that curve. The other side of the cove cut is done exactly the same way. You just rotate the chisel around and use the opposite slope to define that side of the curve. And then work back and forth to meet in the middle and get the shape that you're after. And of course you follow the same process to do the other handle. The short handle is just going to be used to turn the saw blade so it doesn't have to be very large. The larger handle is what you're actually going to be hanging on to to do the sawing. So it has to be quite a bit longer and it needs to fit your hand. Hi, I'm Dennis and thanks for watching. As most of you know, for the past few years I've been producing YouTube videos on a part-time basis. I am now looking to turn that hobby into a full-time job and for that I really need your help. A small monthly contribution from a really small number of viewers will generate the income that I need to achieve that goal. So if you're interested in the work that I'm doing and you want to lend your support, please click on the Patreon icon at the bottom of the screen. Thank you. We'll see you next time.